for example, vent their power on the weak without recognizing what it is that they're doing. If, for example, they think what they're doing is merely a student problem, they're wrong about that. But that risk that they will mistake what it is that they're doing and pursue misguided ends, falsify their achievement. Um, this is a risk that Nietzsche thinks uh, is worth taking in order to avoid the greater threat, which is violence, that we will come to feel no ends are worth pursuing at all. Um, okay. So we need to make sense of this. We need to um, try to understand um, how it is that this ascetic ideal represents a kind of will to power, expression of the will to power. So the first treatise described what Nietzsche called the slave revolt in morality, in which there was a kind of reversal or inversion of the noble system of values. But it was something, it was something of a mystery why that would be triumphant. How could it be that the moral system of values um, which was, you remember, expressed by and embraced by the weak. Um, how could this triumph over the noble system of values? Uh, well, part of the answer, I think we can now start to see, um, is that the slave revolt in morality, the creation of moral values, um, comes from uh, the ascetic idea, is attached to a certain form of asceticism that has proven very, very attractive to human beings. In fact, Nietzsche says a little bit later on that this ascetic ideal has been the dominant ideal, in fact, he says, the only one, for something like 2,000 years. However, it's coming to an end. So through a process that we'll see in a few minutes, this dominant ideal, this dominant picture of what a valuable life um, would be, is now collapsing. That's the threat of nihilism today. Um, OK, so our question now is, well, why is that so attractive to human beings? Why is it that asceticism has been able to serve as the dominant ideal for 2,000 years. And the answer is, somehow or other, that contrary to appearances, contrary to what it says on its surface, asceticism actually is an expression of the will of power. It's actually a way of expressing life. Um, in particular, it allows an expression of the will to power among people who are unable to express it in other ways. The weak, the sick, the cynical, the tired, the individuals who are unable to um, well, psychologically pursue proper uh, accomplishments. So their will to power still looks for a way of expressing itself. Um, and the ascetic ideal provides a way of doing that. And so that's what now we need to understand. How a doctrine that's about self-denial can actually involve some kind of affirmation of the will. Um, so there's still this paradoxical nature. So there, 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 there are kind of two paradoxes going on here. One is uh, that the the ascetic ideal is about self-denial, but is actually a way of expressing one's will of power. The other paradox here is that while, I mean, there's a sense in which the second paradox is the first one backwards. The second paradox is that while asceticism has given us an ideal, has given us uh, an expression, for a way of expressing our world of power, 
now he thinks it's in danger of collapsing and denialism. Um, so we need to see both of these. Okay, so um, on to the ascetic priest and the promotion of um, asceticism. And how it can be that through self-denial we are expressing our will to power in a disguised way. Okay, so uh, section 15, um, on page 91, um, uh, maybe line 14 or so. What's important here is that the ascetic priest, the promoter of the ascetic ideal, um, does two things at the same time. On the one hand, he cultivates resentment, generates feelings of resentment toward initially um, those who are um, powerful. But most importantly, in addition to cultivating this feeling of resentment, changes its direction. Line 14 here on page 91. For every sufferer, sorry, the priest changes the direction of resentment. For every sufferer instinctively seeks a cause for his suffering. Still more precisely, a perpetrator Still more specifically, a guilty perpetrator who is receptive to suffering. So someone who sinned, who is guilty of doing something wrong, that explains why I am suffering. In short, some living thing on which, in response to some pretext or other, he can discharge his affects in deed or in effigy. For the discharging... Um, uh, uh, for the discharging of affect is the sufferer's greatest attempt at relief, namely at anesthetization, is involuntary craved narcotic against torment of any kind. Um, it's here alone, according to my surmise, that one finds the true physiological causality of resentment, of revenge, and all their relatives. That is, in a longing for anesthetization of pain through affect. Further down at uh, 91, what the, so the ascetic priest on the one hand nurtures and develops these feelings of resentment as a kind of narcotic in order to relieve our suffering, to relieve our uh, frustration at having the world not the way we will it to be, our inability to make the world as we want it to be. Uh, so um, someone must be guilty, must be to blame for my suffering, for my inability to make the world the way I want. So that's the promotion of uh, the feeling of resentment. And now comes the redirection. Someone must be to blame, sorry, so here's um, what the ascetic priest says. Someone must be to blame for the fact that I feel bad. Someone must be sick. Somebody must be guilty for why I feel bad. This kind of reasoning, he says, is characteristic of all those who are diseased. Um, uh, indeed, the more the true the cause of feeling bad, the physiological one remains concealed from them. Over on to 10. I am suffering, for this someone must be to blame. Thus every diseased sheep thinks. But this shepherd, the ascetic priest, says to them, that's right, my sheep. Someone must be to blame for it. But you yourself are the someone. You alone are to blame for it. You alone are to blame for yourself. So in addition to... Um, cultivating this uh, resentment. I'm suffering for this someone must be to blame. In addition to that, the priest redirects that resentment and blame back onto, onto the weak party herself. Someone's to blame, and it's you. This is bold enough, he says, false enough, but 
one thing at least has been achieved by it in this way. As noted, the direction of resentment has been changed. Um, okay, so our question still is, how can this ascetic ideal that cultivates resentment and then redirects it back onto the weak, sick, relatively powerful as individual who is unable to express his or her will to power outwardly <coughs> and is therefore, sorry, should I say this again? So individuals are frustrated and suffering precisely because they can't make the world the way they want it to be. The world is a hostile environment where they're unable to do what they want. That's just saying on the one hand that they're weak, they're unable to express their will to power outwardly in the world to make it the way they want. And it's also to say that they're suffering from that. They're unable to make the world the way they want. Okay, so in those kinds of conditions, what the ascetic priest does is generate the emotional response of resentment, of hatred, and then redirects it back to oneself. So, we're getting closer, but the question still is, how can this be part of the will to life? It's directed back on oneself. 92. Um, to make the sick, to a certain degree, harmless. To destroy the incurable through themselves to strictly direct a more mild sect toward themselves, to give a backwards direction to their resentment, and in this manner to exploit the bad instincts of all sufferers for the purpose of self-discipline, self-supervision, self-overcoming. As goes without saying, this, quote, medication, a mere, a mere affect medication, it absolutely cannot be a matter of true healing of the sick in the physiological sense. One could not even claim that the instinct of life in any way was healing in mind or intention. Um, so this strategy of cultivating resentment and then redirecting it back on oneself, well, on the one hand, um, uh, on the one hand, it can be effective. It can be a way of re relieving the feeling of suffering. It's a kind of narcotic. It's a kind of anesthetization. On the other hand, note well, it's not addressing the underlying problem. It's not truly curing the issue. Um, so on 93. Um, section 17. The ascetic priest combats only, sorry, he combats only suffering itself, the listlessness of the one suffering, not its cause, not the actual state of sickness. This must form our most fundamental objection to priestly medication. So again, the cultivation and redirection of resentment may relieve the feeling of suffering. But what Nietzsche really objects to here is that it's not getting at the fundamental problem. Um, okay, again, over on 95, um, the most amazing thing about this strategy is that it often works. That is, it often works at relieving our suffering, even if it doesn't cure the underlying. Um, so, I mean, on 95, he's basically saying, um, middle of the page, he's basically saying that the ascetic priest is kind of a genius at manipulating human psychology to precisely anesthetize the worst feelings of suffering. Um, and I guess what I want to say is that Nietzsche is not entirely opposed to that. Um, he thinks that the